Relations change so much that they can no longer reproduce with one another. They are considered separate species on the tree of life. Smith and Snyder want to see how closely related the highland birds are to the birds they examined in the lowland rainforest. Again, is that right? They yeah. compare color, beak length, wingspan, just as Darwin would have done. But they have another tool that Darwin never even dreamed of. DNA. Darwin was convinced that traits were passed on from generation to generation, but he didn't understand how. We now know that the sequence of the four chemical building blocks of DNA determines the traits of all living things. Each generation passes on this text of A's, T's, C's, and G's to its offspring. But occasional mistakes in copying, mutations, can result in new traits. By comparing DNA, we can determine who's most closely related to whom. We can determine when they had a common ancestor, when they diverged from that common ancestor. Laboratory analysis reveals that DNA from the rainforest hummingbirds differs only very slightly from that of the highland hummingbirds. They must have diverged from a common ancestor relatively recently in the history of life on Earth, about three million years ago. We're examining the genetic material that makes organisms what they are. And written in that DNA is the history of their evolution. The fact that the blueprints for all living things are in the same language the genetic code of DNA is powerful evidence that they all evolved in a single tree of life. How is it that organisms that are so different can be related? That we are related to a flatworm or a bacteria? Darwin emphasized that small changes would accrue every generation and these changes could build up to amount to enormous changes. It's not really hard to understand how major transitions could come about given that life has been around for three and a half billion years. Darwin really had it right. Be good shot. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Parker. Miss Wedgwood. You've met my cousin, Mr. Darwin, before. Sir, he's fast, eh? Fastest in the county. You breed him yourself? I mated him with a bitch who was pretty swift. And how would you breed a fellow like Squib here? From the runts, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you? Squib is quite as nice as any of your rotten dogs. It's true. It's from the runts and monsters that breeders can produce tailless cats. Or pygmies, like squib. I'm not listening to any more of this. Take me back to the house at once and stop saying horrid things. From wolves to greyhounds. From bulldogs to fellows like squib. In what? A matter of a few hundred years. I take it you don't find talk of dogs all that interesting. I can think of more interesting topics of conversation. Such as? The novels of Miss Austen. And what did she have to say about selective breeding? <laughs> Nothing, as I recall. Ah, that's a great pity. Why shouldn't nature produce such differences? These different breeds of dog? Why should it? What would be the point? Survival. In nature, a little poppet like Squib, who was the smallest in her litter, would die. You nearly did die, didn't you? Yes, that's true, but what about the one with a little more vigor? Or a head start? Because of some peculiarity? Such as? A puppy. Born with an extra thick coat in a hot climate would be a monstrosity. But in a cold climate, that would be a good adaptation. That puppy would have an advantage. 
got you. Charles. Emma. Let me go. Not until you've paid the toll. Which is? A kiss. For me, rather than the dog. You can make a big dog or a small dog, but you can't produce feathers on a dog. Nor can you create organs as miraculous as the heart and the eyes. That can only be the work of God. Hurry up. It's these blasted ties. Marry? Not marry. Marry children, if it please God. Give me that. It's private. Nonsense. I'm your brother. You've no secrets from me. Yes, I do. I have secrets from everybody. Give it to me. Uh, thank you, Garmin. Constant companion and friend in old age. Raz. Uh, object to be loved and played with better than a dog anyhow. <laughs> You old romantic. Well, it's intolerable to think of oneself spending one's life like a neuter bee, working, working, working. And all this is a response to your trip to Cousin Emma's? Not necessarily. Well, you don't know anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Your collection won't be complete without that most interesting specimen in the whole series of vertebrate mammals. And why haven't you married if it's such an enviable state? Oh, I'm too lazy to take on anything requiring as much effort as a wife and family. But you're the marrying kind. Good Lord, what's that? We're being mobbed. They probably think we're poor law commissioners. Why would they think that? It's enough that we're top added tops in a smart carriage and they're scavenging on rubbish heaps, starving to death. Too many people, not enough food. Thank God we'll always have food on our plates. Speaking of which, I think I'll have the turbot in the white sauce. Cabbage, sprout, cauliflower. All bred from the same ancestor. Cabbage, the leaves, sprouts, the side buds, cauliflower, the flower head, all monstrously enlarged. Sitting opposite me is that strange creature, Homo thesis. Half man, half theory. A word of advice. In my entire life, I have known only three women who were skeptics, and two of them were not permitted in polite society. Keep your theory from Emma. It's too late. I told her. Well, sort of. Not a theory. I don't have a theory. I just thought. How did she take it? She asked me to read her favourite part of the New Testament. <laughs> Our Saviour's farewell to his disciples. You see what I mean. I am the vine and ye are the branches. If man abide not in me... Wilberforce's ears have pricked up. If man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men shall gather them, and they shall be cast into the fire, and they are burned. And how is your soul? What? Your fish. Mm. Delicious. I understand your carriage was stoned on the way here tonight. Well, we're meeting the threat on the streets head on. Oh, yes. mm, we're drilling with the Honourable Artillery Company. Gentlemen volunteers. In the event of riots, we will back the police. Every man, as long as he obeys the law of the land, should be free to pursue his own interests in his own way. Yes, of course. <laughs> Charge what he likes for bread or anything else for that matter. Is he fair? Let individuals compete and struggle for their advantages. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Whenever I can't sleep, I reach for Malthus. 
or as I prefer to think of him, the Reverend T.R. Morpheus. Still warm. Two brandies, hmm? Yes, sir. The natural tendency of mankind is to reproduce. Humans can double their numbers every 25 years. But they don't. A struggle for resources slows growth, and death and disease, war and famine check the population. I know the argument. Yes, but don't you see exactly the same struggle takes place throughout nature? I don't know why I didn't make the connection before. Why are we not overrun with insects and frogs? Well, given the rates at which they reproduce the number of eggs produced by each and every female. Nature's broom sweeps away the ugly ducklings, the runts. Yes, yes, but it's not that simple. <coughs> it's not that simple. Sometimes it's the ugly ducklings that are better adapted to the situations of life. They have longer legs and can run faster. They have bigger beaks that can crack harder nuts and seeds in harsh winters. They survive, have more offspring. Nature selects them to pass on their traits to future generations. And where do we fit in? Well, the sun does not revolve around the earth. Nature does not revolve around man. Man must fall into nature's cauldron. He's no deity, no exception. Once you accept that species can pass into one another, the whole fabric totters and falls. They'll burn you at the stake for this. Yes. But now you have a theory. So I said, don't come down the ladder, Mother. I've taken it away. Good evening. Darwin's work began with the observation that individuals differ from each other. And these minute differences, Darwin believed, might be advantageous. It might give each individual an edge when it came to getting food or finding a place to survive in nature. Darwin realized that in nature, individual organisms compete for limited resources. Those with some kind of advantage, in coloration, for example, or in speed, or in vision, are more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on these advantages to their offspring. Those who are less fit will not succeed. Darwin called it natural selection because the forces of nature select which organisms will survive. The survivors will be those whose variation fortuitously adapts them better to changing local environments. And then because they pass on those traits to their offspring, the population changes. That's natural selection, that's all it is. It's not a principle of progress. It's just a principle of local adaptation. You don't make better creatures in any cosmic sense should make creatures that are better suited to the changing climates of their local habitats. That's it. Darwin couldn't actually see natural selection acting in real time. But today, scientists can, by observing the evolution of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Jeff Gustafson has been infected with HIV for over a decade. He takes a host of medications, but to little avail. The virus keeps adapting, evolving into new strains that evade the drugs. There's a pervasive feeling that all you have to do is take your medicine and you'll be okay, and that really isn't the case. You know, HIV has the capacity to evolve no matter what you give it. There are 19 HIV drugs on the market today, and of those 19, I've already been through 14 of them. Clarence Johnson, too, is locked in a daily struggle against the rapidly evolving virus. Sometimes I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle. I haven't given up yet, but there have been times that I just want to just lay down and give up. But um, I can't leave my family behind. <laughs> 
Clarence Johnson's doctor 